Hello, I'm back today with another professional who is here to share some of their expertise with us. Today joining us is Hannah Rochford, a PhD candidate in the College of Public Health in the Department of Health Management and Policy here at the University of Iowa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Hannah. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So to get things started today, would you just like to tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you to the University of Iowa? Yeah, certainly. So um, I'm an Iowa native. Uh, I was actually also at Iowa for my undergraduate studies, um, but I hadn't found my professional home in public health yet. So it was in a research project within um, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics Medical Physics Department that I kind of stumbled into, um, I'll say, a love for research and a, a hunger for system level prevention. So I, I accidentally found my interest in violence prevention um, around this same time. Um, and I followed these interests into a master's of public health program at Loyola Chicago, and then was very excited to have an, an offer to allow me to return for um, my, my PhD at the University of Iowa. So what kind of drives you to keep going through your education journey to pursue that highest level of PhD? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, a, a number of factors led me here, I think. Um, I've had really wonderful mentorship from researchers and community-based practitioners um, and from survivors of, of violence that I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with. Um, and there's, you know, a, a myriad of, of ways to contribute in that space that, that don't require uh, a PhD. But these individuals help me see both how much progress had been made in the violence prevention space, but also the system level barriers that kind of impeded additional progress. And I, I wanted very much to do my best in serving those impacted by violence as, as a public health challenge um, and to further elevate prevention with the best evidence available. So to me, a, a PhD offered a path towards understanding existing evidence and then developing a skill set to generate and translate new evidence to kind of create positive change. So I'm, I'm pleased to say that's exactly what my, my training in the College of Public Health and with our um, Injury Prevention Center has, has conferred. So your work heavily focuses on violence against women. Um, can you share with us a little bit about what makes you passionate about this topic? Yeah, sure. So um, I had a few few experiences prior to um, entering my, my master's that kind of planted a seed of interest, uh, but that interest really blossomed during my time working as a shelter advocate with the domestic violence intervention program during and, and shortly after my master's. That's where I came to understand the stories that kind of um, fell behind these, these events, right? I, I saw faces and I saw families and I knew names. And, and the experiences that they trusted me with kind of cemented my understanding of why this public health challenge is so pervasive and so persistent uh, and why certain communities are disproportionately affected and why right, gender-based violence, partner violence, family violence events are so um, cyclic or often cyclic, I guess, between generations. Um, and as we know from Alex Kollowitz's writing, uh, stories can be very powerful, right? Once you've seen those experiences, there's there's no unseeing them. Um, there's no going back to the way that you saw the world before. So the only way forward is through, um, I guess, whatever small steps you can take to try to make things a little bit better. What better way to get at these stories than in a firsthand basis, right? <laughs> Um, so you had a recent publication in August of 2022 with professors Mark Berg and Professor Pikesa, mm -hmm. uh, Corinne Pikesa, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, both of whom I hope to interview for this series as well. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about this publication? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure to get to um, work on the, the project and, and collaborate with Professor Berg and Professor Pikesa. Um, we have the opportunity to use a data set called the NVDRS, um, and that stands for the National D Violent Death Reporting System. Mm -hmm. um, and this data reflects some exciting progress in the field as it's kind of a like a complete list or a census of every violent death that occurs in participating states. And now all states are participating. So before this data set existed, the violence prevention field had lots of challenges with data, and, and it still does. Let's, you know, not get too carried away. Um, <laughs> but prior to the NVDRS, most of the large secondary data sets were, 
were derived from healthcare sector data or justice sector data. And the healthcare data tended to include a lot of information around the nature of the injury, but pretty minimal information regarding the circumstances surrounding the injury. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the justice sector data kind of offered the opposite, right? Strong circumstance data, limited kind of injury data. So beyond that, a challenge with both of these sources with data is that the same communities that have the greatest risk for violence um, are the communities that are going to have the greatest barriers accessing the healthcare sector and the justice sector for services. So this data then underrepresents their experiences. And if the data that the research community is using doesn't represent these communities, then we risk having the prevention strategies that we would derive be maybe ineffective for these communities or in a worst case scenario, um, potentially harmful to these mm -hmm. communities. So again, not to say that the NVDRS data that we used is without limitations, but it allows us to access both strong injury information and strong circumstance information, um, which is how we understand which homicides are intimate partner violence related and which homicides aren't, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that data also overcomes the concern that we're excluding the experiences of certain communities because it's a census, right? Absolutely everybody who, um, again, has a, a violent death is, is present here. So we use this data to understand intimate partner homicide rates across states over time. Um, and then we look to state policies to understand where and when boyfriend loopholes were present. Right, so many states have policies that prohibit people who are convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor um, or subject to a domestic violence order of protection from owning or acquiring a firearm or ammunition. And if domestic violence is defined in a way that only includes um, violent events between married individuals or co-parents or people who cohabitate, and it doesn't include to date, or it doesn't generalize, I guess, to dating partners who don't um, meet those criteria, mm -hmm. then a boyfriend loophole exists because those firearm prohibitions would not apply, right? Even if the violent behavior was the same and then, a setting where people were married, they would apply that that little sneaky loophole would make it so um, a, a perpetrator who was in a dating partnership could still own or acquire a firearm. So what we learned, right, understanding or kind of looking at our outcome data in the context of this policy data was that when states take steps to close their boyfriend loopholes, the model predicted fewer expected intimate partner homicides amongst white victims. However, we didn't see that same relationship carry over with victims of color. And so this finding indicates that while these policies may be helpful, um, as they're currently being enacted and implemented, they mm -hmm. aren't equitably effective. Hmm. So what sorts of steps to closing this boyfriend loophole have some states have been taking? Sure, so closing the, the loophole in and of itself, right, is an important step, right? At least having it be um, on paper where if you're um, displaying that violent behavior, cool. you're not in a position to own or acquire a, a firearm, that's an important first step, but mm -hmm. also acknowledging, okay, um, what are the barriers that are particularly or foreseeably making these policies less effective for certain communities, right? If we know that we have to have an a protective order or we have to have a misdemeanor conviction before um, we're even eligible to be considered for these firearm prohibitions um, in our communities of color, again, maybe aren't as comfortable engaging the justice sector for support, right? That right there is a big barrier. If I'm nervous about um, calling the police and, and starting the process to um, pursue again a conviction or a protective order, that's that's kind of a non-starter, right? If I don't have those two things, I, I really can't move beyond that. Um, states vary in terms of if they extend protective, or excuse me, if they apply the firearm prohibitions to protective orders, to misdemeanor convictions, or to both, right? So mm -hmm. some states have kind of partially closed the loophole by addressing maybe the misdemeanor or the protective order. Um, but what we also found from our analysis was the 
protective order loophole was particularly important because that tends to be less burdensome to acquire than the full mm -hmm. conviction. So most states that had the misdemeanor conviction also extended it to, um, or excuse me, most states that had the protective order can parameter also had the misdemeanor, but not all states with the misdemeanor piece also included the, the um, protective order piece. So making sure that even the states that have taken kind of a step in the right direction are doing so in a more comprehensive way could be important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about some of your other publications? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you might have to, to cut me off. It's a dangerous thing to, to ask a researcher broadly to, to talk about their work. But um, I guess my, my research kind of collectively considers how different public policies shape violence outcomes. So the types of violence I, I tend to work with include intimate partner violence, um, yeah. but also include child maltreatment, firearm violence, and, and some suicide. So um, my work tends to be pretty quantitative leaning, um, but I use and appreciate both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, so some of my other recent publications name um, certain school-based policies as protective against um, dating violence among teens, um, more accessible childcare subsidies, is protective against different forms of child maltreatment. And um, another a different set of school-based policies being protective, um, not at keeping child maltreatment from happening, but improving the probability that child maltreatment would be identified and then reported. And have these seen some solid avenues for future, re future research and application? I hope so. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite things about policy analysis is that the translation is, can be so direct, right? Mm -hmm. um, all, all science, all learning is valuable, right? But we often don't know um, how to implement what we've learned right away, right? There can be kind of a, a, a gap there. Whereas with policy analysis, usually it's pretty specific, right? We we have this strategy, we looked at it against outcomes, and it, it offers a, a really readily usable finding. So I'm hopeful that not only will these works and in future related works, right, kind of support um, good work that's happening in the research community and in the practice community, um, but also um, serve our, our public decision makers well, right, as, as they try to um, hopefully, right, make choices that protect the, the health and well-being of their constituents. Absolutely. So what do you think is most important for our viewers to know regarding violence against women and interpersonal violence in general? I know that can be a pretty broad umbrella question, but. Yeah, yeah, and it's tough, right? Because most implies one, but I, I have offhand, I think maybe even two pieces um, come, mm -hmm. come to mind if I can sneak both in. Of course. Because um, I, I think the first, I guess, it's just that it's happening, right? It's happening right now. You know, I, I worry sometimes that because these experiences are so painful and so unsettling to think about, it's really easy to, to let ourselves believe that, well, maybe it happened to someone at some point and, and someplace else, but it certainly would never happen to me or would never happen to the people mm -hmm. I care about or to the people in my community, mm -hmm. right? And that just couldn't be further from the truth, right? So accepting that uncomfortable reality is, is one key piece. Um, second, I, I think I would want people to know how, how vital it is to defer to someone experiencing violence as the expert in their own circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. And that sounds maybe really intuitive, like it would be an easy thing to do, but it can be so tempting, right, if we're trying to support someone navigating dangerous or abusive circumstances to want to like jump in and just yank them out um, or otherwise intervene to kind of distance the person that we care about from this terrible thing. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't and it, and it can't work that way, right? Violence is about power and control and system level and individual level factors shape how much power a person has and therefore how vulnerable they are to violence, right? So perpetrators of violence behave in a way that exerts power and takes away victims' control over their own existence. And this can be with physical and sexual violence or with mental, emotional, or economic abuse or, or any combination of those types of harm. Um, and even if we have the best of intentions, right, trying to take 
over on behalf of a victim that we want to support, it essentially does the same thing. It takes away their control. Mm -hmm. So our ultimate goal has to be to empower the person experiencing violence and reinforce that they're deserving of respect and take cues from them as to what they need to reach safety and reach healing. And as difficult as it is to watch someone go through the ups and downs of violent circumstances, the most important thing that we can do is to not let them be isolated further. Right, to make sure that we've established ourselves for a safe place for them to come and seek support, not someone who will let, again, our own emotions take precedent over theirs and also take their power away. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just about shifting control from a harmful party to a party that's trying to help. It's about them regaining control of the, their own circumstances. Absolutely. It can be a fine line to walk, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the author of focus for this year's One Community, One Book program was Alex Kotlowitz. Mm -hmm. um, his work focuses heavily on gun violence, especially in urban centers. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you um, enlighten us as to how you've come to understand gun violence through your work? Sure, sure, absolutely. So of the, the outcomes that I named earlier, right, intimate partner violence, child maltreatment, firearm violence and suicide, right? Firearm violence is kind of its own independent outcome, but it's also a contributor to all of those other types of harm, right? right? And all, all violence is a concern, right? All harm is harm, but firearm violence is particularly concerning because it has the potential to be so lethal, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm injured with a firearm relative to something else, I am much more likely to die from that injury and or have really um debilitating consequences from that than I am from from other types of harm and so I think um again to the credit of our one community one book committee it's absolutely kind of a specific type of violence that deserves um a, a spotlight um so mm -hmm. I, I kind of entered this space after coming to understand that the consequences of violence um gun violence or, or otherwise right are, are never experienced in isolation right the, the consequences for a person um, directly affected and for the people around them are, are both severe and are are both persistent right and Alex Kalowitz is writing paints a very vivid picture of that um, after understanding these stories one can't help but feel a, a, a call to action so to speak right mm -hmm. I, I felt drawn to public health not just to support the healing of those with these experiences, but to find a way to reduce the number of individuals that, that would have these experiences as part of their story. And, and Alex Kalowitz does a very skillful job of, of making these, these stories that he shares come to life for, for readers who, again, perhaps have life experiences that are very different from the, the characters, right? The people that he features in these stories, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and stories that are just as meaningful, but that aren't brought to the public's attention in the same way as the stories highlighted in Mr. Kalowitz's books um, exist in our data. Right, every observation in the data sets that um, you know violence prevention researchers and public health researchers work with um, represent a person with with a story and a story that had a really difficult chapter. Right, and so perhaps it's indirect, but in in learning from what happened to them and how we can do better, I feel it's it's a way to to honor that story in a small way. And, and Alex Collett's work, I think, also highlights that, like many public health challenges, the burden of violence and gun violence in specifically isn't equitably distributed, right? Individuals who hold identities that have historically held lower social power, like communities of color, like women, like people of low socioeconomic status, like people within the LGBTQ community, and, and others tend to encounter violence at disproportionately high rates. And the mm -hmm. systemic reasons for that are, are also visible throughout Mr. Collett's writing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Certainly not a, uh, certainly not a one-dimensional topic. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, it all kind of intertwines and each has an impact on each. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose we are approaching the end of our interview, but if our audience wanted to learn more or to get involved, what sort of things would you recommend they do? 
That's also a good question. As someone who's in the applied sciences, I appreciate that, right? Like, what is the do? You know, right. our ideas and, and understanding things are wonderful, but hopefully, right, we're we're in a position to translate in that into, you know, again, positive, positive behaviors. Um, and, and public health has a, a mantra, um, and I see it all over on like t-shirts and, and things. And so maybe you're familiar with it too, but that's prevent and protect, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if I could add a third P to that, it would be partner. Um, you know, there's so many organizations who are doing phenomenal work to prevent and respond to intimate partner violence or firearm violence or other forms of community violence and then child maltreatment and suicide and so on. Um, and training as an advocate or volunteering or donating or otherwise directly supporting these organizations can be really powerful. Um, so doing those things if they're available to you is great, but as crucial as that work is, as long as we continue to think about violence prevention and response as the responsibility of only our community-based organizations, this will remain an enormous problem, right? Their role is in supporting those who have already had this experience. And mm -hmm. because the um, prevalence of this public health challenge is so enormous, there's so few of their resources left over to try to lead prevention work. So again, it, it cannot be beyond or on only their, their shoulders, right. right? So can, while the professionals in that space, again, do incredible things with those finite resources to make things better, but we really need partnership across sectors if, if progress is going to um, happen, right? To the extent that we would like to see it happen, you know, and so mm -hmm. can we each take stock of how our skills or each of our day-to-day -day roles could be used to help address these systemic sources of violence or to protect those um, who, who are experiencing it, right? Like if I'm, if I'm a parent or if I'm a teacher, am I having conversations about healthy conflict resolution or about firearm safety? Or if I'm a business owner, am I training my employees to recognize signs of harm and know what, what to do to support one another if, if they do see something? Mm -hmm. Or am, am I using my opportunity as a voter to advance policies that promote evidence-based prevention or that bolster families economically? If I'm a clinician, um, you know, am I helping the survivors that I'm caring for understand and man manage the long-term consequences of mm -hmm. the violence that they survived? Um, as, as a person, um, am I being cautious to avoid language or behavior norms right, that minimize violence um, or, or reinforces negative stereotypes um, that certain communities are subjected to? Mm -hmm. You know, violence is ultimately a community-wide problem, and so it requires a community-wide response. Um, and so as much as possible, I, I recommend that we all find find a role, right? How can we work across disciplines? How can we contribute the skills and the perspectives that each of us have to understand this issue and to implement solutions that make it so fewer people have these terrible experiences and to ensure that those that encounter violence have the support that they need to get to a better place, right? It's, it's, it's an everybody problem. This is not um, one sector or one way of thinking. Everybody's got to, again, take, take a small step in the right direction. Absolutely, as a community as a whole. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, no, my pleasure. It's been great to great to chat, and I'm so glad that again, um, Alex Kalowitz got to share share his insights um, and and kind of start these conversations, or not start maybe, but but continue them. At least started for the University of Iowa this year. Yeah, yeah for our <laughs> purposes, anyways. Right. No, thank you so much. I, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Uh, to the members of our audience, thank you uh, for being here as well. I hope you learned something. <laughs> and I had a lot of fantastic insight to share with us. I hope you took something away from today. Um, please join us again next time where we'll have a, another professional back with us to share some of their expertise as well as we continue our educational journey.